Content over everything. By the way, the end of three is the same. There's a second person supplication there. The point I'm making to you is this. I will leave him due to his tuck here. But look it up for yourself. Thank you. Thank you. I think now. The point I'm making to you, she, made, she gave two examples of chapter two and chapter three. If you gave me any numbers between one and 114 that are next to each other, I would have been able to do this. Yeah, fine, no problem. 80 is Abbasa, yeah, and 81 is Sekwir. Isn't it? Yes, yes. So, chapter 80 is Surat Abbasa, yeah, and 81 is Surat Takwir. So it's interesting, yeah, because at the end of Surat Abbasa, it's talking about Yoma Yufirru Mar'u Min Akhi. The day when the, his, the, the, the guy, uh, a man will run away from his brother, the day of judgment, yeah? So it's talking about uh, there's going to be a day when there's going to, some people will be on the right path and their faces will be illuminating, illuminating, literally the faces illuminating, yeah, and up glowing, illuminating, etc. And other faces will be dark. Do you know how Surah Al Taqwir starts? Either Shams or It talks about something which is inherently illuminating, which is the which is the sun. Yeah, when the sun, yani, revolves around itself. But then it makes reference to the same thing. It makes reference to the Day of Judgment. Because when the sun is wrapped around itself, it's for us imagery which is related to the Day of Judgment. So chapter 80 and chapter 81, the beginning, the end of chapter 80 and the beginning of chapter 81 are inextricably linked in so much as that they both mention or reference the, the Day of Judgment. They're both, they're both referencing things which are illuminating. They're both referencing things which are dark because when the, when the sun is wrapped around, it will become dark. And on the Day of Judgment, those people, there'll be people's faces that are illuminating and other people's faces that are dark. Point being is you gave me two numbers, yeah? Yep. She gave me two numbers. The point is this, the whole Quran is like that. It's structurally interconnected. So what I've understood from this so far yes, is Yes, please, that, give, give me what you've understood. Yeah, in the uh, context of just this is the book by itself, without having the context of Muhammad, you can say this uh, linguistic device about how they're connecting things to Kirtan. But in yes. the context where this in response to um, situations are spontaneously arising and not answering to it, the fact that uh, this linguistic coherence can be there dis in the face of those indicates something that's really quite extraordinary. Absolutely, that's, thank you very much. You see, I'm happy that you've understood that, yeah? So what I'm saying is that when we talk about the inimitability challenge, it's not just an aesthetic value judgment, you see. It's actually something which can be tangibly um, kind of measured. And here I've given you a structural example of that. Because what I'm saying is this, the argument is as follows. The argument is with this structural coherence of the Quran argument, which is by the way made by, not, by many people, not just myself, by many non-Muslim orientalist people. Even Kuipers makes the argument. He's, he's non-Muslim and he makes, I think his name is Michael Kuipers. He makes the argument of a co a correlation and interconnection in the Quran and other books, right? But the point is this. The point I'm making is, when we look at the, because the thing is this, if we're saying that the Quran, and this is indicated by the contents of the Quran, it was circumstantial. So the Prophet received the revelation circumstantially, you see. He didn't know what people were going to ask him. He didn't know because he couldn't know. For him to know what people were going to ask him, it would indicate that we'd have to know the future. Now, if he didn't know people were going to ask him questions, and the book was revealed circumstantially, Yet, when it comes together in a, in, a, in a piecemeal format, which is not connected to the overall chronology of the Quran as it stands now, and it makes sense then and now, and it's interconnected then and now, then you would say, how is that the case? Because the thing is this, the Quran was not revealed in order of chronology. So in other words, chapter one wasn't revealed first, then chapter two. Well, that's not the, form, that's not the um, formula of revelation. Chapter 96, verse 1 to 4 was the first thing that was revealed in the Quran. Wait, so um, how did they work out the order? Was so the Prophet Muhammad got instruction from the angel Jibreel. Was this uh, before the, they, he started orating the Quran or afterwards? Afterwards. Well, if he did it afterwards, isn't that just part of the editing and stitching it together? Could they have stitched it together any way they wanted? No, that's, the, that's a very good point. So you say, okay, they could have stitched it together whatever they, were, they wanted, yeah? But the thing is, if, if you have now, think of it this way, yeah? You know a puzzle? Puzzle, you, know, you, know, you know puzzle, yeah? yeah. Okay, a, a puzzle, okay, a puzzle 
by its nature, in order for it all to fit together, it must have sides which connect with other sides. Think of the Quran as a puzzle, okay? If the Prophet, if the Prophet was getting each like segment of the puzzle piecemeal or delivering it, yes? And then at the end of it, now he's got all these pieces of puzzles. In order for him to know that all of it will eventually fit together and make an overall mosaic or a puzzle or whatever, he would have had to have a retrospective knowledge. Why? Because you can't create a puzzle based on, like, are you, are you with me or not? Are you following this? Yeah, I'm, I'm following it, but this I'm saying sounds that, a, a little on. weaker to me. Okay, let, let me like... say it one more time. Let me say it one more time. So, hold on, sorry. Maybe I've... You don't understand what I'm saying. So let me try and make I, it clearer. I, I definitely do. But you do, yeah? Yes. Okay, good. I like it. When you do, then, then the, the message has been delivered in a way, yeah? What I'm saying is, it's not possible so, for example, if today that, someone that, comes, that's yeah. the bit why I'm not following you. The, right. Where you say it's not possible to yeah, do it with it's, another it's, it's not possible for someone for you to predict what questions people are going to ask you. Like me right now in the speaker's corner. Yeah, it's not possible for me to have predicted that you were going to ask me about chapter 80 and chapter 81. It's not possible that I was going to predict that she was going to ask me about chapter 2 and chapter 3. It's not possible for me to predict what people are going to ask me because that would require a full knowledge of the future. But what you would be able to do is to take all of the answers that you had given over the course of your life and uh, compile them into a way where you had the same structural correlation, right? That's what I'm saying is not possible. Why not? Do you know why that's not possible? Because, in, in other words, when you were first receiving that question, say for example, this guy asked me a question. Yeah, sorry, I don't know your name. Yeah, sorry. He asked me a question, right? Now, he's asking me any question. Say for example, yes, Alunak al Khamr al Mason. He asked me about uh, intoxicants and gambling. Yeah? Yes, Alunak al Ahila. They ask you about moods. They ask you, yes, Alunak al Haid. They ask you about a woman's uh, like, you know, menstruation. They ask you about this. Whatever. There's so many questions in the Quran. I would have to, now I'm answering him, I would have to have two considerations. One consideration aren't to you coherently in a way which makes sense to you, yeah? And which will primarily benefit you and all the primary audience in that historical time period. But then my other consideration would be, I would also have to make it so that what I'm saying to you is generally relevant to the overall text, which I will then put together. Do you see what I'm saying? Now I'm saying that having those two considerations at all times is not possible because for it to be possible I would have to know something about what's going to happen in the future. I would have to know who's going to be fighting me, who's going to be asking me questions and all these things. Do you see what I'm saying? That is the structural coherence of the Quran. That's why people are amazed by it. It's not because necessarily it's some aesthetic value judgment. It's because, interestingly, it's actually a measurable lexical standard whereby people can, you not even using, you could be a non-Arab and actually see in any surah of the Quran, a, a particular lexical phraseology is repeated and then in the next surah, the same lexical phraseologies are repeated. So here, then it creates this kind of, you can think of it as constellations in the sky, I'm trying, I'm trying to use that example, where it seems like a heap of, you know, random uh, stars, when you start to put it together, it becomes like well, constellations. What it sounds like to me is that, that you see this sky and you see they don't see these constellations or these order, they can just move brand stars arbitrarily and then go, oh, look, there's constellations now. And now no, but the, thing, the, the interesting thing is, this is we, we can't make a judgment like that because when we talk about lexical phraseologies, yeah, they are actually measurable. So letters and words which repeat themselves or which have similar constructions All right, is I, what we're I, talking about. I, I think I understand. Yes, yes, yes. So this is measurable. It's not something which is an aesthetic value judgment. It's not an input. It's not, it cannot be a superimposition. It can't be uh, me trying to uh, find patterns and, and, and intentionally putting my own. It can't be that. You know why? Because it, in, it necessarily requires an extrapolation of the Lexus. Has there been like some kind of statistical analysis to kind of show how yes. unlikely? Yes, there's many statistical analysis that I've done, yeah? To be honest with you, some have even used, and I'm not, I'm not completely against this approach, by the way. I haven't made a video about this yet, formally, because I wanted to do a good uh, like, uh, research on it, yeah? But I'm not necessarily against the whole mathematical coherence of the Quran thing. I'm not against that, by the way. Some people are against that. I understand that some people have gone too far with it, like this whole 19 theory. I understand that. What, what's that? There's some 19 theory and stuff. But the thing is this, is that in addition to what I've just said to you, because this is a strong argument, I think you, you see the merit of the argument, yeah? 
In addition to what I've said to you, some people have, have actually looked at certain words and phraseologies that are used in the Quran and then repeated. So for example, some have, by the way, done a bad job of it. Some, of, some I've seen, and I've done this myself, done the research, some of it is wrong, by the way, yeah? Like, for example, the word, uh, some say that, okay, the word yom, the word day is repeated in the Quran 365 times, yeah? But the way they've done that, I don't believe is correct because they've, they've looked at constructions which are like yom uh, and yom, yomain, and they put it all together and they've added that 365 number. And 365, by the way, is the Gregorian calendar. It's not the, it's not the, uh, it's not the Islamic history calendar anyways. The Islamic history calendar is 359 days. Anyways, the point I'm making is, there are some words in the Quran, okay, that are repeated in a certain amount of ways. Like, for example, and I've done the research my, on this myself. I can, I can be corrected, so if someone wants to correct me, I don't mind. The word Adam, which means... Adam, yeah? And the word uh, Isa, which is Jesus, are both in the Quran 25 times. Now, you might think that's insignificant, okay? Actually, it's significant, because in chapter 3, verse 59, it says, in That it is certainly the similitude of Jesus to, because uh, this is a response to Christians, right? So Allah says to, Allah says that certainly the similitude of Jesus is like, like that of Adam. He created him from dust and said, be and he was. In other words, do not, this is the argument that's made, do not think that just because Adam, uh, that Jesus didn't have a mother, uh, a father, that his father must be God. Because if you apply that logic, you should say that Adam is also a, a, a son of God from that perspective. So that's the argument that's made. What's interesting is if you count the amount of times that the word Adam is mentioned, up until chapter 3 verse 59, it's seven times. And if you count the amount of times that the word um, Isa is mentioned, Jesus, it's also seven times. But also if you see the whole Quranic discourse, both names, Adam and Jesus, are mentioned 25 times. Now you might think that's, contra uh, that's, uh, that's a coincidence, but by the way, there are many of those. Well, yes, but this is itself I find so convincing from the perspective that you can go through any text and count the number of words and you could probably find lots of different ways to combine things. They might make sense, but they... they if I'm using like it as a supplementary argument. Yeah. I'm just, I, I I'm just, I'm just mentioning it because you yeah. said it, right? Okay. You, you asked about statistical analysis, so, so yeah. I'm going uh, into, into that context. The uh, kind of idea of... Okay. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. So I'm, what I'm saying is... I think is, this guy might need to independently no, no. investigate No, no, no it's fair enough, but I can tell you that some of it is bogus. Yeah, I can tell you that straight away. That some of their websites, they go too far in that stuff. Yeah. And they don't do themselves a favor by doing that. Like, for example... Like man and woman, 24, 24, 23, 23. Yeah, what is so it? So it's kind of debatable. No, no, like but there are some things which are not debatable. Like, for example, this. Like, this, there is no debate that Adam is in the Quran 25 times and that Jesus is in the Quran 25 times. Well, why couldn't that be? Well, you, you said can that's count an the words. You can literally just count the words. The yeah. amount of times that Adam is mentioned and the amount of times that Jesus is mentioned. But Do you get what I'm saying? What I mean is, um, if you saw, um, like, that Adam and Jesus thing, and then you also saw that identically for man and woman like 25 times repeated there another two set of random words and everywhere yeah. you looked you saw this 25 repetitions that would be sufficient but if it's just one example no, no, there are, there are, no there's lots of examples that's the issue there's actually more than one example of this right okay there, there, there are literally handfuls of examples the reason why i'm only giving you one is because that's the one i independently verified so okay. i don't want to give All you right. any more that i haven't I think I've, I've, ind I've independently verified a few others, but I don't want to even mention them. All Just right. because if I'm wrong about them, I don't want to be wrong about them. I but I'm giving you, uh, there, are, there are a handful, more than a handful, dozens of those, which are interestingly correlated with the meaning of the Quran. Because the meaning of the Quran, so for example, in this particular verse, it says that Jesus is like Adam. There's uh, about 114 chapters, right? 114, yes. Component, in terms of like combinations, would you need to have like 10,000 correlations ish to kind of like exceed around the charts? Well, I, I mean, if we kind of have a hundred different things combined with a hundred other things, then that kind of comes to like 10,000 different connections. And if you have kind of 10,000 possibilities, Sorry, I'm, I'm just saying, saying that you need to have a lot, a lot of correlations. So yeah, I mean, you don't need to have anything. I mean, the, the thing is this, is I'm saying in, in instances where it's really, for example, right? Allah only calls himself, 
Yeah. Oh, sorry. So Allah only calls himself Al Ahad one time in the Quran. Okay. Why? Because he's Al Ahad means one and only, right? So he only calls himself Al Ahad once. Another one. Like, do you know what we were talking about before? Yeah. You know, chapter 4, verse 91 or 92, where, where it says that they did not ponder over the Quran with care had it been from other than sorry, God. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, there would be yeah. many contradictions, yeah? You know the word ikhtilafan? Ikhtilafan in Arabic is only mentioned in the Quran once. The Quran. Right. So that's the, Which uh, means contradiction. Or, oh, oh, right. Yeah, because if it was there more than one time, then someone could say, okay, you know, the, whole, the word contradiction is there more than once. Therefore, you know. Anyways, the, the point is, the point is this. I guess what I'm trying to say to you is, there is an interesting, very specific nature of the Quran when it comes to its... Um, it's Allah. discourse, yeah? Oh. Yeah. Can I give you this? Um, I, I, sure. Thank you. How many you got one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and oh, that's and that is the linguistic miracle of the Quran, the structural miracle of the Quran. Why can we confidently, yeah? Why can we why can we confidently say that this is inimitable? We can confidently say this is inimitable because I can just simply say, well produce something, okay? Now okay, now it becomes quantifiable. Because now I've given you, and uh, now it's a bit of a, now we've looked at the kind of under, underwires of this thing, yeah? Okay. But I say, look, it's not just aesthetic value judgment. I'm saying, no, it's, yeah, the linguistics are an important part. You do require some specialism in that in order for you to understand that. But when we start to think about things which you don't require linguistic specialism to necessarily understand, like, for example, the structural coherence of the Quran, like, for example, even the numbers that we talked about, the delicacy in the way that God mentioned certain things, a certain number, which correlates with, yes, which correlates with um, the, the, the mentioning or the, the meaning he's trying to put forward, yeah? And also the fact, and also the fact that there are, as we talked about and we've discussed a little bit, the predictions of the Quran, the explicit predictions of the Quran. I would say these are things that now anyone can do. You don't need the Arabic language. Get me someone, anyone, that can basically come and produce a text three lines long that not only fulfills those criteria, but also is able to change the landscape, the sociological, the geopolitical, the historical landscape in such a way as would allow me and you, actually, to have this conversation 1,400 years later in Speaker's Corner. And by the way, this is one of the evidences, because in the Quran it says, وَرَفَعْنَا uh, uh, Yeah, That Allah says to the Prophet Muhammad that we have certainly yeah, raise your status and, and, and mentioning. Yeah, in chapter 93 of the Quran. Uh, sorry, I heard you uh, to go through this argument in another video. Yes, yes. So that's another point, right? I don't want to, if you, yeah, I'll, maybe I'll put the link down for the other video because I don't like to repeat myself in this corner. Sometimes I have to, but you, if you heard me say that, that's another, you know, the effect. Yes? Yeah, I think you were like, make, make my grandchildren say my name, make more grandchildren say my name. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, you were very enthusiastic. Yeah, I'm not going to do that again. Eh? <laughs> okay. I'm not going to do that. Well, you see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah? Deep down, these are things that we've got in place. We've got things like, okay, no contradictions. We've got inevitability, in, in, which can be measured, yeah? Quantifiably. And then we've got this, this thing here, which we haven't talked about, which is the most important thing. The premise. The premise is, yes? that this message, the message of Islam, is the most coherent message for an explanation of why we are, why, why we're here, and where we're going. That's, that's it. Yeah, and, and generally speaking, that's the message of Tawheed, which is to believe in and worship in one God and His oneness. Yeah? To believe in and worship in one God and His oneness. And we believe that that is the most coherent explanation for the beginnings of the universe and the best way to live a life. So when the Quran proves itself in the ways that I've just mentioned, because it has proven itself, we believe it has proven itself, yeah? And it gives the evidences in, in those ways, because the woman was asking about evidences. I believe those are evidences, yeah? When the evidences are put like that to someone, like yourself, Ashley, the question is, what is stopping someone, right, from that perspective, from joining the community of 1.8 billion Muslims and actually becoming a Muslim and actually submitting themselves to, to the, the will of the Creator? So, uh, um, what the kind of it, it's rated through, it's, it's a, I think it, it indicates the Quran has come from a divine source, but yes. Um, yes. there's a couple of aspects which um, I think are worth exploring. So, 
for instance, we, if we, although Allah might have given this text to Muhammad, yeah. we don't necessarily, the only source for a lot of the attributes of Allah and a lot of these kind of moral attributes is Allah himself. I, it's easy to say that because Allah is a perfect teacher, right? He uh, created uh, the. Uh, I think he communicated the Bible and then allowed that to be uh, corrupted. But he, and not the he Bible, was like the, the message to Jesus and stuff. But yeah, yeah. But at, um, he he did allow that to be corrupted. And That's right. It's, then my kind of question is yeah. why. And he's also tailored messages to specific contexts historically, is my understanding. But how do we know that um, the message that he communicates in the Quran wasn't us totally different, but it contained some fundamental truths, and he was had to like tailor the message like a huge amount to be able to create the spread of Islam and that actually there's kind of an evolution of these ideas that hasn't been realised. Okay, so what, what's the point that you... So, oh, I mean, if we look at mathematics, for instance, yeah. uh, we have the same kind of requirements mm -hmm. where everything is interconnected. You start from a stable base of arithmetic, which kind of contradicts itself, but whatever, that's besides the point for this. You're going into uh, gold now, yeah? <laughs> Is that, are, you, are you making a philosophical <laughs> reference to Kurt Gödel? Uh, no, because you were saying the stable. But anyways, yeah, uh, don't worry about that. Yeah, no, go on. No, but um, it, the mathematics it builds up itself. It references each other. Yes, it, yes. Um, if you look at uh, relativity, for instance, special relativity, it makes a huge amount of predictions which only have recently been empirically observed and. The, those, all of those truths about the universe were induced from these kind of things that um, like fed back onto themselves and oh, that, to me that has the kind of same characteristics of divinity. Right, okay, uh, okay, okay. okay I, get, I, I get your point now, yes. So you're, you're basically saying we have science and science has been able to do this so we don't really need religion. No, no, no. What, I'm not saying that. What, okay, sorry, I, what yeah. I'm saying is that science is yeah. an extension of religion. And yeah, okay. that bit, uh, there was kind of a point where we need to, it to be told about the fundamental truth of the universe. But now we've been given the opportunity to discover that yeah. for ourselves All and right. to expand well, on I, that. I think that you're right in a way because I, I don't think there's a problem with pursuing that kind of recourse. Like, frankly, yeah, I think science is a really interesting way of, as you say, getting to know about the physical environment around us. Science is a, is a way of realizing patterns and regularities in the universe. From a, from a historical perspective, that's what science is really, yeah? Science is a way of realizing patterns and regularities in the, in the universe from a historical perspective. And I say to you that science's concern is not with how we should, what we should be doing in our lives, or why we are here, all these things. Science is just simply concerned with materialistic phenomena, naturalistic phenomena, and why such naturalistic phenomena exist in a certain context, historically, in, in a certain um, in a certain way. Now that's well, something. What I would say is that science is like a new tool, and we might discover tools that to uh, unearth these kind of moral truths as in the future. Yeah, no problem. No, but I don't think science, though. Science is concerned with how. Science is not concerned with why. So okay. what I say to you is that whereas science has been very good for us, and we don't want to let go of it. You know, what we're saying is that religion has a different, it's a different thing, okay? So, well, Islam is telling you why you exist. Science may be able to tell you something of how you exist, in what context, in what naturalistic context, but Islam is telling you why. Science can never tell you why. Because of its naturalistic presuppositions, right? Science is a... It, Does evolution not uh, provide an explanation for why we're here? No, it doesn't. Not at all. No. How so? Well, how would it? I mean, the question is, how would it? Like, I mean, what, what would it be? Uh, to be efficient, may reproduce. It, and, well, that, that sounds just like a total base thing and absent from morality, but I would say that uh, it provides... Um, it, it, 
describes how moral characteristics can arise from that uh, very basic thing. And um, so uh, I, as part of my job, I uh, train artificially. I do artificial intelligence and I will have like a very simple objective for the model so I'm trying to train like uh, uh, tell me if this is a cat or a dog and it's looking at images for instance. Really interesting. But so you, you do, you're into artificial intelligence, yeah? Yeah, but uh, through just that single objective it also learns lots of other things. It learns what fur looks like, it learns what faces look like. It can take that learning and it can bring that to a lot of different areas. Yeah, I find it interesting. I've, I've had discussions about that. I'm not sure if you've seen any of course, yet, but like about the limits of artificial intelligence, the limits of naturalistic and materialistic presuppositions and how it, the, hard pro the hard problem of consciousness remains a hard problem with, um, with artificial intelligence. I genuinely think that science speaking, generally speaking, yeah, is very useful, yeah? However, once again, it's n I don't think anyone has ever made the claim that science is omniscient, or that it's able to actually um, give us some kind of meaning in life in a, in a moral perspective, or in a moral way. So what I'm saying to you is that where we can, you can continue wearing your scientist hat on, it's no problem. It doesn't stop you from being critical from a philosophical or otherwise theological perspective. Okay. And what I'm saying, what I'm proposing to you is something which does not contradict your um, your kind of taste for science, or whatever it is, and your scientific, uh, you know, that you, you want to go and do science or whatever. Yeah. What I'm saying to you is, generally speaking, that the option, the theological option of Islam, from a logical perspective, a, you know, even a psychological perspective, is probably the most coherent. It is the most coherent one, and therefore. I invite you right, to become a Muslim, generally speaking. Now, you know the arguments, you've heard some of what I've said online, so I, I don't need to repeat like, you know, why we believe that one God is one God and these things. You've heard this stuff. I want to say to you that, do you see that there, is there any alternative model that you've seen or that you know, that is basically any better or any be a better explanation, uh, explaining why we're here or what we're doing here than Islam? Um. Yes, but it'll take me five minutes to explain, is that okay? Take time. Um, so, uh, I used to be an atheist for kind of a uh, very long time, and I look, started looking around and I realised that the only reason I had to come to those beliefs was because I basically wanted to look smart. And um, I kind of, what I did want to do was to um, look at a particular doctrine and fall into it because it seemed it seemed right. I, I wanted to kind of come with critical thoughts and so over the course of, of a few years I kind of meditated on the uh, structure of the universe and it's only uh, now in 2018 that I've started to look at other religions to see where the similarities are with the ideas I've come to independently and I found that and I found inconsistency with Islam and I think that's worth exploring. So uh, I was kind of looking around the uh, universe and I kind of realised, okay, there's a septillion planets, I can see how life could uh, arise from the level of atoms there that we have septi a septillion chances. But uh, if you look at, uh, there's 15 orders of magnitude to get from uh, atoms to life, basically, to the scale of us. If you look at, say, from the black ink level to up to us, uh, so the quantum flame, there's about 30 orders of magnitude and to get that level of coherence, well, if we say there's only one universe, there's only one attempt to do that. Yeah, that means that this universe is somehow special. Uh, now there's a couple possibilities for that. Uh, so one of the possibilities is that there are a great, great, great many universes and one of them just happened to be this one and we're aware of it because we have the awareness to be here. Yeah. The other explanation is that there's an intelligent creator and that's a lot more likely because um, if it's a lot easier to create a universe that's tuned to life than just have one randomly appear. It's right. like you just have to tweak a few things if you've done it before, it should be fundamentally easy. Then you kind of run into um, a slight issue of... Uh, so I was thinking about Allah at this point and Allah doesn't just have qualities like being infinite and such but also moral qualities and the, 
to kind of be merciful, that's contingent of a creation to be merciful towards. And I was wondering... I don't, I don't think that's true, though. You don't? No, no, no. The Quranic discourse doesn't say that it's, his, his mercy is a contingent one. It's a, in the Quran, it says in chapter 6, that he, he prescribed upon himself mercy. So, in Islam, there's, there's two kinds of um, fundamental attributes of God. There are fundamental attributes which are called uh, dhatiya, which are basically uh, intrinsic attributes of God that are not contingent on anything, right? And other ones are called fa'aliyah, which are basically uh, attributes which require action of some sorts, yeah? So, uh, his mercy is not one of the fa'aliyah ones. It's not one of the um, verbal attributes. It's one of the intrinsic attributes of God. In other words, because Allah says in the Quran, كَتَبَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ um, that he's, he's kind of mandated upon himself to be merciful. That, that would be the case uh, independent of anything that he has to be merciful to. It's just intrinsic attribute of God. That's him. That's When we talk about Allah, we're talking about the merciful one. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, no, but what, you were, what you were saying was quite amazing, so continue please. But what I mean is how might these attributes kind of manifest themselves in the first place? And the kind of conclusion that I came to was that the creator of this universe was actually uh, f finite in some capacity. Say again, sorry. The, the creator of this universe, just this universe, was finite. But I think that over the um, that the, the universe. Why did you come to that? Because as I couldn't see how the complexity of all these moral attributes could exist. I, I could see how to be infinite, to be timeless could exist. I couldn't see how something as complex as um, kind, kindness or to be yes. a teacher could all right. come No, that. I get that point. No, no. We're well, right in a way, because let me tell you why you're right, right? Logically and de uh, deducibly, you can't actually deduce uh, Rahmah or the mercy of God. You can't deduce his love. That's not something which you can deduce logically. It's not a logical attribute. The reason why I believe that God is merciful is not because I've logically deduced it. Okay. Yes, I believe God is merciful because God tells me he's merciful through a book which I believe is an authority which is called the Quran. The things which are deducible, as you indicated, are things like his oneness, things like his power, things like his knowledge, things, things like um, the fact that he was there preceded the universe, because that's deducible in terms of um, a, log a logical deductible method, yeah? However, things like, like you say, moral attributes, which I think is a really interesting terminology to use, things like love and mercy, they are not deducible logically. They require a, a kind of, a, you know, a, a, someone to tell you those things, right? So I would say that rejecting those things, though, could constitute fallaciously an argument from ignorance. Because just because you cannot deduce something logically, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So what I would say to you is that with the, with the logically deducible attributes, that should constitute for you a rational base to understand that there should be an existence of a deity which started the universe, is maintaining it and sustains it with his might and mercy, uh, might and uh, knowledge, right? Because these things are deducible. However, when you've, when you've come to realize that, you understand and you've come to accept the premise also that we are also intrinsic sentient, uh, sorry, sentient beings which are uh, purpose, uh, which have a purpose, then there must be some kind of connection between the creator and the creation. And once you've understood that connection, then you realize the need for revelation. When you, once you've realized the need for revelation through the intermediaries of prophets and angels, which are metaphysical things which we can't uh, ascertain uh, materialistically or, or through science, then you come to realize also <coughs> Right? That it is necessarily the case that we have to be taught those moral attributes through a revelation. So those moral attributes like his mercy and his love cannot be deduced. Yet, as, as Muslims, we would maintain, since now you have an epistemological foundational base which presupposes the oneness and the power and the knowledge and, and the pre-existence of a God, of a deity, of an intelligence, now it's not hard for you to actually make um, to make a judgment, a critical judgment, that is potentially the case that this same deity is the one who revealed himself, itself, whatever, to the creation. Yes, and so.
so, so we look at the different choices we have. And of the, of the different moral choices or religious choices we have, we looked at the Bible, we looked at the coherence of the Trinity, we looked at atheism, you've seen how incoherent that is. So we come to the, the conclusion of Islam. And Islam, as we say, is not just a, a religious uh, doctrine which says that one God exists full stop, but it aims to provide the evidences, as we aforementioned, uh, through the, 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 the Quran and through the Prophet, which indicate how it is that this God actually revealed himself. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, but it doesn't completely answer everything. Go on, what, what things are remaining? So, uh, it's not so much uh, what's remaining, but like a, a perspective shift. Go on. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yes, we can ascertain that the Quran came from Allah. Yes, we can ascertain that Allah has many metaphysical characteristics. And the um, moral characteristics we can only know because he himself told us. Yes, but yes, um, yes. The, the, there's many explanations for him telling us that he has these characteristics. Yes. Uh, for I mean, that it could... I, I, it just seems like uh, by taking the, these moral characteristics at face value, we're trying to like re read his mind and suppose what he wants for us. When a, as a teacher, I feel like the fact that we have tools like science and maths to, and to explore to kind of tells me that, that there's an aspect where we need to be able to and the room for interpretation in the Quran, it, I don't see how it can be the whole entire truth. And I, it seems like certain characteristics of Allah, I don't see how it, I, I struggle to understand how they can coexist. What, the interpretation? What, hmm? which, or what, the fact that human being is critical? Um, sort of. Sorry, I'm a little I don't, lost I don't, I don't, That's all right, so, so, no, it's good. Uh, and how they don't correlate they can't be two at the same time. Uh, yes, it, it feels... Or rather, I don't see how they can be contained within a single entity. Well, listen to me. I mean, I, I can see what you, I'm trying to really understand where you're coming from. I understand where you're coming from. I, I think, by the way, you're quite an intelligent guy, you know? I think you've got a hidden genius. This guy's a hidden genius. And I think your, your, your speciality must be some kind of science or mathematics or physics or something. Am I right in saying that? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, because I've, I've noticed through your disc, from the discourses that you've got interesting uh, insights in that field in particular. But what I wanted to say to you is that, listen, we don't need to kind of overthink this. Sometimes a simple truth is just a simple truth, yeah? What I'm proposing to you is that there is one, I'm going to put this in the most simple way, right? There's one deity that created the universe with his knowledge, gave the, the, uh, the universe laws of physics, yes, okay. allowed it to have the laws of physics. I can accept that. Maintains the universe. How, how, do, you, how do you figure that one? You can, you can figure that logically, yeah, through contingency. Because if we say that the universe, if we say that anything within the universe is contingent upon... Uh, upon something else in order for its existence, yeah? Okay. The universe itself is contingent upon something else for its existence. Uh, sorry, by maintenance, do you mean as in Allah is still around, still doing things here and there? No, God or, or, is, is well, the, the universe depends upon God. Okay. The one who created it. So, so uh, this isn't like a garden nurturing trees. What, what, what do you mean by maintenance exactly then? No, 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 okay. Maintenance just means it's, 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 conti it's continuity. It's continuity. So how comes the uh, universe is not blowing up, or, or how comes it continues? Oh, yeah. Because, like, yeah, uh, if, like uh, if you create a tower one day, you wouldn't expect it to spontaneously fall down. And if it were a perfect tower, you could expect to build it, leave it alone, never touch it. The tower again, relies it upon X amount of factors in order for it to exist, right? So the tower exists in the context of the universe. If the universe ceased to exist, the tower would cease to exist, right? Okay. Okay, if the laws of physics cease to operate uh, in the way that they were historically operating, the, the, the tower might not 
stand still, or stand uh, high. So why do we say that the universe is contingent on Alan instead of saying that Alan could have created the universe, left it alone, and now it's continuing by itself? The reason why is because if you think about God's or Allah's uh, attribute of him being there first, right? Okay. If we pre-assume, as we've done kind of, that God is one, that he is all-powerful, his all power means that anything that generates thereafter him is going to be generated by him. So anything, anything which happens and which requires source and sustenance is going to gain that source and sustenance from the original. And, not, and, and it's not going to be so, a self-sufficient... Uh, well, do you remember something I was saying earlier where I said I thought that the creator of this universe was finite but that uh, Allah or the actual God of everything uh, our creator was within that God. So do you believe in... No, no, right. So, what we, what we would say to you is, the moment God allows for something else within his creation to have the same amount of whatever it is that he has, is the moment he has replicated and duplicated a God. Yeah. Yeah, so if that happens, then you have more than one God, which is a contradiction anyways, right? No, I, I, I would say that the creator of this universe is not a God. I would say he's just a creator. So do you believe in there's two creators or something? Uh, no, I, I, so what I believe is that there's one God and within in that God is like the nature of uh, existence almost as yeah, okay. in all of these uh, metaphysical right. attributes. Right. Spinoza's God. Hmm? Like Spinoza's God, you're talking about. Sorry? Spinoza's God. Spinoza? God. That's Spinoza. He's yeah. here. This is just the idea that nature and itself is a sort of metaphor for God itself, the laws of nature in itself, whereas it's not a thinking or rational being. Yeah, there goes that. Uh, uh, that, that, that. That sounds good. Is that what you sort of mean? Uh, yeah. I want him to kind of get, just, just what, what you want to get whatever it, you're what saying. The crux of yeah. the matter is like underlying yeah. what, what's the basic question that you um, so, uh, well, I would say that um, nothing can necessarily be outside of those laws of nature, but he could have a creator within those laws of nature and then that uh, creator might be finite and you can have creations outside of that creator. Right. Okay, so what, to, finite in what? Because the word infinity, of, of, uh, like infinity itself, has to be applied to a certain context. So what are we talking about? Finite in what? Infinite in what? Why do you need like, an intermediate? Hmm? That's what you're talking about, right? You need yes. an intermediate. Need, I, I think Why you need an intermediate. That's needed? Hmm? Why do you think that's needed? I think that's needed because of the moral characteristics and the incompatibility of uh, kindness with just physics and nature. I would see th those as something that have to arise from uh, the, um, those, and I would see kind of like the genesis of the creator of this scene first as something that's similar to evolution, and I would uh, say that there, there were metaphysical characteristics of the universe yeah. which made it possible to have a creator with more characteristics which then in turn made it possible for this Actually, universe to appear. I think you've got a lot of ideas, okay? I think you've got a lot of ideas. I don't want to... I don't want to put anything on you. I've kind of given you what we believe. I think you know what we believe, right? You yep. know what we believe. So long as you know what Muslims believe, okay, I've done my job, okay? All right. You get what I'm saying? Okay. I'm happy that we've come to this conclusion. You've got really interesting ideas, actually, right? What I'm going to do, I'm going to give you my number privately, and I'm just going to allow you to read the Quran. I'll give you some selected chapters. Okay. Then you can tell me what your perspective is after having read those things. Sure. Yeah? Yep. Actually, it's been a pleasure, man. Uh, sounds good. Thanks, man. Thanks a lot, man. Cool. Who's, uh, who's on you, man? Uh, I'll take them all and sell them on eBay, give it. Yeah. <laughs> Out of curiosity, which aspects do you think contradict? Um, yeah, here's Oh, uh, I can find it online, I think. Yeah. Or, okay, uh, yeah. You can find it online, bro. Thanks. I was curious when you talk about the intermediate world, is that a personal world? Bro, take it. Content of everything! 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 Content of ever
ده قران يو بيليف ان اول قران وين ده قران سيد هو بني الاسلام على خمس I make a name. The basic nominal Muslim does five goals because none of it is jihad and none of it is da'wah. Okay. If you are Muslim and you imply five these pillars and you are fighting for the bridge for any kafar, are you Muslim or kafir? Have I fight? What? If you, I say if you, he's telling if you. If a Muslim done five things and they are not enough because there is iman with six pillars different this and there is this. And there is a tabir. So there is a metric for how Muslim I can be? I, you I cannot, man. Because you are ignorant and you're talking about... Why? Why because, you, because you're talking as if you are Ibn Kathir or Ibn Qayyim or Ibn Qudama. First of all, I never said... I just told him I could be completely wrong, but I'm coming You are. I could. No. You are. That's your interpretation. 